Thanks for coming. So today uh, we have a Jason Wong, who is uh, the greatest student at Columbia uh, State University. And he will talk about something on data rates arising from the long term. Um, thank you for introducing me, and I, it's very grateful for me to give a talk here in IBS. So thank you, Professor Um, to ask me to give a talk, and thank you all for coming. Um, today I would like to talk about a two isomorphism theorem for delta metroid, and this is based on the joint work with uh, Professor E.I. Moffitt. So this is the table of contents. And um, in the first section, I would like to introduce what uh, Whitney's two isomorphism theorem is, which was the main motivation of my, our research. And in the second section, I will state the main theorem. But as you can see, there are eight pages in the section two or so, because I have to define lots of things. So I feel sorry about that in advance. but. Um, I will give you as many examples as possible. So even though you can, you may forget the former definition of it, but you will understand what's going on. And in chapter three, I will give a proof. And in chapter four, I will give an application to a not theory. So I'm kind of nervous because like most of you may be more experts in graph theory or metro theory, but Anyway, I'll give a quick review on what's the metroid. So metroid is given by a pair of ground set, which is a finite set, and a basis, which is, which is a non-empty collection of subsets of E satisfying so-called basis exchange axiom. So um, pictorially speaking, basis exchange axiom is, is about uh, for two distinct x and y in the collection B, if you want to subtract a element x, you can always find y here to such that this somehow fish-shaped thing is in the collection again. So this is the basis exchange axiom. And there is a way to construct a metroid from a graph. So here's what cycle metroid. The cycle metroid over graph G is a metroid given by a, um, we set ground set E as a set of edges. And we set basis to be a set of spanning forests of G. So for example, if I set my, um, graph G like this, then there are lots eight spanning trees, but um, I'll just check if the set of spanning trees satisfy the basis exchange axiom. So if I put T1 like this and T2 like this, and if I want to subtract X here, I can, um, I can pick Y like this. So T1 minus X, union y becomes something like this. And this is, again, a spanning tree. So this is not the proof, of course, but you may understand what's going on. So as I explained, there is a way to construct a matrix from a graph. So a natural question arises. So the question was, when two graphs G and H have isomorphic psychometroid? And uh, I put some pictures here. So there are operations called vertex identification, vertex cleaving, and width twisting. And you may easily see that the um, structure of spanning forest does not change when we apply these three operations. So, so it is easy to see that vertex identification, vertex cleaving, and width twisting does not change the cyclometry. What is more surprising is actually the converse is true. That was Witten's theorem. And the statement is like um, 
The cycle matrices of G and H are isomorphic if and only if we can obtain H from G by applying series of um, operations, including vertex identification, vertex cleaving, and Witten twisting. So actually, the converse is true. So this theorem was my main motivation because I was studying ribbon graph and delta matrix theory, and there's an um, analogous story about those things. So to state my our main theorem, I have to define some things. So first of all, there is a notion called a uh, ribbon graph. A ribbon graph G is a surface with boundary with two set of disks. So we call A set of disk VG of vertices and EG uh, edges. And they have to satisfy the following three conditions. So, but sometimes picture speaks more than a thousand words. So I'll just give a example. So this, this, these two big circles are representing vertices. So there, this ribbon graph has two vertices and four edges. And those who are uh, familiar with the topological graph theory, you can think of ribbon graph as a cellularly embedded graphs on surface. So for example, this one right here gives a ribbon graph. But we can also think of a graph on a torus which looks like this. So to obtain a ribbon graph from a, a graph on surface, what you have to do is fattening a edges and vertices of the ribbon graph. So you can obtain something like this. And you can see this one is equal to the, this one. So this is why sometimes we call a ribbon graph as a fat graph. But it's not politically correct. So <laughs> we rather call them a ribbon graph. And uh, there are another way to understand what's the ribbon graph. For example, oh, sorry. If you have a ribbon graph like this, this is basically just a graph. So this one is equal to a graph. But if you consider this ribbon graph as this graph, you lose some information. So you have to add some information. So you, we have add two kinds of information. One is cyclic ordering of edges because In this ribbon graph, you know at vertex V, there are cyclic ordering of edges, 2, 1, 2, and 3. So you have to add this information. And there's one more information you need. Uh, I will call half twists. So this, is, this example is bad. But, um, you can give a ribbon graph like this. So we have to add an, uh, the information about half twist to recover this ribbon graph. So ribbon gra in summary, ribbon graph is just a graph with two additional information of cyclic ordering of edges and half twists. And there is another notion I have to define, a delta matrix. Before I define a delta metroid, let's recall what a uh, metroid was. So metroid was a pair of ground set and basis, which satisfy the basis exchange axiom. And basis exchange axiom was something like this. And this fish-shaped object was in the collection. 
And this basis exchange axiom can be broken down to two conditions. So one is symmetric exchange axiom, and the second one is a condition of equicardinality. So here, uh, the, the symbol delta means a symmetric difference. So I will give a pictorial explanation on what is symmetric exchange axiom. Not like the basis exchange axiom, we can pick x here, and we can find y in symmetric difference of x and y. So there are three possibilities. First possibility is uh, y is from y minus x, and y can be in x minus y, and even more, y can be x. So in this case, So this um, leaf shaped set is in the collection, or just x minus x is in the collection. So there are three possibility when we uh, set a collection to be to satisfy a symmetric exchange axiom. But if we have a condition of equicardinality. That condition eliminates these two possibilities. So that is that those two conditions are equivalent to give a uh, basic exchange axiom. But how about forgetting about the equicardinality? So why not? So I just delete this equicardinality condition, and that makes this set system as a delta metroid. So, so delta in a delta metroid, um, there. Are uh, it is a pair of ground set, which is a finite set again, and we call a collection of non-empty collection of subsets of E as a feasible set, which satisfy a symmetric exchange axiom. So we can have, we can also have these two possibilities. Yeah, and there are a half way to go. So, so remember that cycle metroid was defined by a um, pair of edge set and a set of spanning trees. So we need some kind of spanning trees in a ribbon graph. So quasi tree for a ribbon graph G, a subgraph sub ribbon graph Q is called a spanning quasi tree if it contains all the vertices of G and the number of boundary components of Q is equal to number of comp components of G. And as we define the cycle metroid, we set E to be the edge set of G and F to be the set of spanning quasi trees of G. Then this makes a delta metroid. I will show you an example. So in a ribbon graph on the left hand side, there are eight quasi trees as I drawn in the right hand side. So for example, in the first one, it is easy to see that this ribbon graph only have, a, have one boundary component. It looks like this. And you know, it's hard to believe that the A ribbon graph is a quasi tree. So I'll draw it. And if you believe in me that I'm not tricking you, and I follow all these edges here, and you see that this one also have only one boundary component. So this is actually a quasi tree. And then we can define a delta metroid from this ribbon graph like this. And you have to check that a uh, set of spanning tree, spanning quality trees satisfy that um, symmetric exchange axiom. As always, I will give an example, not the proof. So for a Q1 given by uh, 1, 2, 4, and Q2, I'm 
I'm just writing down the edge subset. Q to be two four. And suppose we want to subtract e, so x is equal to two. Then I can pick my y to be one or my y to be ah no 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 ah yeah yeah symmetric difference of this is yeah or two y is one or two and then q one and symmetric difference of one and two is four and q one symmetric difference with um two is one four you can check that uh one four is not in here so oh oh forgive me i mean what those those two things are all oh, these two are all quasi three so so you can check that we can pick y to this symmetric difference is again a quasi tree so if you believe me this is the way we can construct the delta matrix and um, in the Whitney, the Whitney's two isomorphism theorem, he defined some operations of, on graphs, which I called vertex identification, vertex cleaving, and which is interesting. I had to define some analogs of those operations. So here are vertex join and vertex cut. Um, so uh, don't look at the former definition. I'll just explain by this picture. So I pick alpha 1 and alpha 2 in ribbon graph G1 and G2 and identify them So to obtain this new ribbon graph. This operation is called vertex join, and the inverse operation is called vertex cut. And the other operation looks a bit more complicated. So from um, two ribbon graphs, G1 and G2. For this time, we pick two arcs in each G1 and G2. So pick alpha 1, alpha 2, uh, I mean alpha 1 and beta 1 in G1, and pick two arcs, alpha 2, beta 2 in G2. So there are four ways to identify them. So first of all, we can identify alpha to alpha and beta to beta. To obtain h1 and h2 and we can identify alpha to beta and beta to alpha to obtain h4 h3 and h4 and there are two more possibility because we can identify alpha alpha beta to alpha beta by one direction and we can reverse their direction so there are totally there are four possibilities to obtain we call uh, we say H i is related by mutation if H i is one of them. So, or we just call H i's are mutants to each other. These four graphs are mutants. You imagine there are G1 here, and we pick alpha 2 here and alpha uh, beta 2 here. So, this one is identif uh, one way of identifying G2. 2 and G1. And if we want to identify in a reverse way, we have to do a flip, kind of flip. And if, if, if you want to identify alpha to beta and beta to alpha, we have to flip upside down. And if we want to do it in a reverse direction, we have to flip it twice to get a fourth graph H. Oh yeah, yeah. So, so if you have a ribbon graph like this, it's uh, you can pick arc like this because this you can pick arcs in a boundary component. You can pick like this, but to to apply a mutation, uh, our chosen arcs to be entirely on boundaries of vertices. So this one is okay, but this one is not okay. We have to choose. Like 
can choose the books and then the book of Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, oh, no. oh, yeah. So then, these alpha one, two are two. Alpha one and alpha two are two edges coming out of. Um, like, we pick. Like, uh, can you show some yeah. examples? Like, G1. I, I didn't draw G1 here, so yeah. you can imagine G1 is something like this alpha one and alpha two. something like this and G2 is given by this one and we pick alpha 2 here and beta 2 here so I'll draw this here what was the question? in the picture should it be up one and beta 1? oh sorry 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 thank you so this is not very good example but um to show what a mutation is. So there's one way to identify these alpha betas and these alpha betas. So we can obtain H1 by identifying this just normally to get something like this. Oh, this is actually a really bad example because if I flip there's same graph anyway. uh, or, or I can add something like this so oh anyway uh, if I want to do it in a reverse way I have to do it like this so this vertex is kind of twist, twisted Yeah, something like this. Oh, something like this. Yeah. Oh, do you have to twist the both vertices? Yeah, yeah, but in, in this picture, I I didn't have to draw G1, so I just... Yeah, we have to twist... Uh, yeah, 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 we have to apply reverse direction in both. And, you know, if you want to identify alpha to beta, beta to alpha, we just flip it and we just do the same uh, thing in here to obtain in a reverse direction. So this, this operation is called uh, mutation. And then uh, I'm ready now. So the question was, uh, the natural question uh, again arise. So the question is when two ribbon graphs, G and H, have isomorphic delta matrix. And fortunately, uh, those three operations, vertex join, vertex cuts, and mutation, kind of characterizes those ribbon graphs which have isomorphic delta matrix. So this is our main theorem. And, and I just heard that some people say that uh, there is no good talk which talks about the proof. But I'll so I'll just outline uh, about the proof, and the first step is uh, considering the simplest case. So as I said, we can consider orientable bouquet. So bouquet is just a ribbon graph. with only one vertex. And we say a ribbon graph is orientable if this ribbon graph is orientable as a surface. So orientable bouquet looks like this. So there are only one vertex. There are some edges that does not have half twist attached to that vertex. And we can consider this orientable bouquet as 
core diagram because we just draw a circle here and we put cores in the place where the edge starts and ends. So in this bouquet, we can have core diagram like this. And actually, Uche was studying a theory of core diagram and delta matrix, and he uh, kind of proved the analogous of Uche twice homomorphism theorem in the in a sense of uh, bouquet, oriental bouquet. And the statement, when when I translate it to a word of ribbon graph, the statement looks like this. So for two orientable bouquet G1 and G2, they have isomorphic delta matroids if and only if they are related by mutation. So in the following slide, we will consider broader class of ribbon graphs step by step. So to to step two, I have to define something. Uh, there is an operation called partial petriol. So partial petriol, that picture is not good, so I will just give another one. So partial petriol is just to give a half twist on edges, uh, what I want to apply the partial petriol. So if I have a ribbon graph like this, and if I want to apply partial petriol in those two edges, then the partial petriol looks like this. So I draw same thing, except I give a half twist here, one and two. So this is what a partial petriol is. And I want to remark that for any ribbon graph G, there is a way to obtain an orientable ribbon graph by applying some appropriate partial petriol. So step two goes like this. There was a, um, you know, there, there is a, another operation called uh, loop complementation or local complementation that I denoted by plus. So dg plus e is given by this set system. So this is kind of complicated to, to define, but, and even worse, if, if I apply a loop complementation to a delta metroid, the result may or may not be delta metroids. But in the case of ribbon graph, Chun, Moffat, Noble, and Rukerman proved that in the case of ribbon graph, when we apply a loop complementation, we Again, we get a ribbon graph, a ribbon graphic delta matrix. And moreover, they found that uh, loop complementation is compatible to partial petriol. So, if if I apply partial petriol to a ribbon graph and get a delta matrix, that is isomorphic to a delta matrix of original graph, and applying uh, applied by loop complementation. So this is an example. So in a ribbon graph in the left hand side, there are three quasi trees. And if I apply partial petriol to the edge number one, so I give a half, half twist in edge number one. So there are quasi trees are different, but there are also three quasi trees on the right hand side. And if you believe me, I have to do, uh, calculate this symmetric difference, and we can check that this symmetric difference is equal to the f prime. So this example verifies what the theorem is talking about. And um, there is a lemma that says that g and h are mutants if and only if g of tau a and g of h of tau a are mutants. So, uh, with this lemma and the theorem, I can prove the step two because if I have a ribbon graph g and h, which are bouquet, and 
no need to be orientable. And suppose that we have isomorphic delta matrix. And then we can apply some appropriate partial petrio to obtain G prime and H prime, which are orientable to K. Then by the theorem of Chan, Moffat, Noble, and Rupperman, this is just a, a loop compromutation. So we also have an isomorphism between G prime and D H prime. By step one, we can conclude that these two are related by mutation because they are orientable bouquets with isomorphic delta metric. So in the step one, I proved that these are related by mutation. And the lemma says that these two are also related by mutation. So this is the proof I can do for general bouquet, so orientable or non-orientable. To proceed, I have to define partial dual. So you may know what a planar dual is. So planar dual is considering uh, faces as a new vertices, and we leave edges and we delete the original edges to obtain something like this. And if we squeeze somehow, we can obtain this planar graph again. So this graph G and this graph G star are dual to each other. The partial duals, by the name of it, is applying a dual operation in some of the edges. So um, So if I have a ribbon graph like looks like this, and if we apply a partial dual, the result of graph looks like this. So uh, as we consider a face to be a new vertices, we consider this boundary to be new vertices. So this one is new vertex, vertex and this one will give new vertex too. So. And the edge, you know, this edge right here used to connect the vertices in the up and down. But in this one, this edge right here is the same edge, but now it connects uh, two vertices on the left and the right. So they are kind of perpendicular to each other. So I draw an edge like this. So this is an operation called partial dual. And when you apply a partial dual with respect to a quasi tree, because quasi tree only have one boundary component, so the result G of Q has only one vertex. So it is a bouquet. So for example, oh. since one is a quasi tree, if I apply a partial draw to one, uh, so we think of this boundary to be new vertex. So our new vertex looks like this. And oh, our new vertex, yeah, yeah, it looks like this. And we draw the original edges as they were. And we draw a new dual edge in here. So this edge one connects 
like this. So we have to draw a perpendicular edge. So looks like this. I'll, I'll just draw like this. So this is a, a partial draw. And as you see, if I, have, if I take a draw with respect to a fuzzy tree, the result is a bouquet. So there, are only, there is only one vertex. So this is how I prove uh, step three. So there, are, there is another theorem that relates a uh, partial dual with the operation called twisting. So that, that star means twisting. So we can track how a delta metroid changes when we apply a partial dual. And I give an example, but uh, yeah, let me check. So there are two quality trees here. There, we can pick one or we can pick two. And if, if I apply partial draw to one, I can obtain this ribbon graph. And there are two quality trees. So if I uh, choose nothing, there is only one boundary component. So empty set is a quality tree. And if I choose one and two, there is only one boundary component, if you believe me. So one, two is a quasi tree too. And as I define a twisting, if I take symmetric difference with respect to one, so symmetric difference of one and one is empty set, and symmetric difference of one and two is one, two. So this one coincide with F prime. So uh, do it. Follow with the partial tool is. Oh, okay. Oh, if, if I take a partial tool of just one edge, yeah. Just the what happens to the endpoints? Uh, uh, so, so if you have an edge something like this, you think of boundary of. So boundary sh should look like this, right? And. You consider all these as a new vertex. Uh, so, so it's like contraction. Uh, but uh, it, it is sort of contraction, but we have to uh, put dual edge like this. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. But it's a little bit complicated when you, when you apply partial dual to a loop or some other edges, right, but, yeah, right, but yeah. basically it's the it's how we apply partial draw. Because if you apply the gains and you go back to the initial uh, yeah, 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 because ah, yeah, yeah, because for the boundary of it is like this. These correspond to uh, original vertices, and and we put your edge like this. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. smaller, but the same, the same edge. And again, we have the uh, same kind of lemma that says that uh, G and H are mutants if, one, if and only if it's their partial dual are mutants. So we can do the same thing like this. So in this case, so. Suppose we have connected ribbon graph. With isomorphic delta metroids. And if we apply partial dual with respect to uh, quasi trees, so we can obtain G prime and H prime. And they are bouquets. And by the theorem of Chan, Moffat, Noble, and Rupinman, it's just an, uh, it's, this operation is just twisting. So we still have isomorphic delta metroids between G prime and H prime. So in step two, I proved that two bouquets with isomorphic delta metroids, they are related to mutation. So by the lemma, I gave here, I can conclude that two delta metroids of a uh, two delta metroids of connected ribbon graph, they are related to by 
mutations. So this is the step three. And okay. And the final step is kind of easiest one. So I'll just draw another picture like this. Suppose we have two ribbon graphs. In this case, we don't assume these are connected with isomorphic delta metroids. Uh, but we can always apply some appropriate vertex joint to get connected one. So if I apply vertex joints, we can obtain G prime and H prime, which are connected ribbon graph. And uh, vertex join does not change the delta metric. So we do not have to apply some other operation. The, all these are just isomorphic to each other. So by step three, because G prime and H prime are connected ribbon graphs with isomorphic delta metrics, they are connected, they are related by mut mutation. So in conclusion, I can prove that two ribbon graphs with isomorphic delta metrics, they are related by vertex join, mutation, and vertex cut. So this is the proof of our main theorem. And I'll just recall this. So for maybe 15 minutes, I, I don't think I, I need all the 15 minutes, but I give you an application of our theorem to a knot theory. A knot is a circle S1 embedded in an ambient space S, S3. So uh, an example of knot looks like this. Maybe we have not like this or like this. So this is just a circle, but in R3. And a link is a collection of knots that do not intersect. So you may think these two are links, or you may think of link like this. They do not intersect, but they can interlace or kind of to each other. And there is a notion called knot invariance, which gives a uh, number or polynomial to a knot that is invariant under isotopy. So we can, we can do something like this, right? I mean, OK. You can easily see that you can obtain this L from L prime by just twisting. You, you, do, you kind of do nothing. So not invariant. If I say our uh, function V is not invariant, if V L and V L prime is equal to each other. So it's not the former definition, but you can apply some isotopy here, and you can always guarantee that this V is not uh, V is invariant under that isotopy. You can call them uh, not invariant. Uh, maybe the most famous not invariant uh, is Jones polynomial. So when Jones actually defined this Jones polynomial at the first time, he defined it as a um, trace of a linear operator on some tensor products of some irreducible representation of quantum group UQSX2. So it's quite difficult to understand what it means. But um, but it was fabulous because Jones actually got his field matter by this uh, construction of not invariant. But uh, it is hard to understand. So unfortunately, we have another definition by this simple recursive formula. 
So uh, someone will notice that uh, this recursive formula might be related to deletion contraction recur recurrence of top polynomial or some other graph polynomial. And that is really true because we can actually relate uh, Jones polynomial and a graph polynomial called Bolova's Riordan polynomial. If you don't know what uh, Bolova's Riordan polynomial is, it's just a analog of top polynomial defined on ribbon graph. So this is procedure how we get uh, Jones polynomial. So from a knot K, if uh, we can project a knot to a plane to obtain a knot diagram, and we kind of do, I say we apply a all A smoothing. Uh, what I mean is, if I have a knot diagram looks like this, in each crossing here, I follow the uh, over arc and do a left turn. So I go this way and do a left turn. And I go this way and do left turn and delete this. I do same thing in each uh, crossing to obtain something looks like this. And I remember where the crossings were. I can easily rem remember, but so I, I, my hands are sweaty, so <laughs> the marks are like here. Um, and I put edges like this to obtain a ribbon graph. And from this ribbon graph, I compute the Bolova's Riordan polynomial. And I can, yeah, I write down what uh, actual specialization, it, specialization of it, but I don't want to explain that. But uh, I will just say that there is a way to obtain a Jones polynomial by specializing Bolova's Riordan polynomial of this ribbon graph. And one thing I have to mention is Bolova's Riordan polynomial is a invariant of a ribbon graph, but it's actually a invariant of a delta matrix of ribbon graph. So if you have a ribbon graph, two ribbon graph with isomorphic delta matroid, then their Bolova's Riordan polynomial is same. So this is what I mean. So in the world of not, uh, we can kind of obtain a result, something like uh, which two not having a same Jones polynomial. So this was my second motivation of this research. And to be honest, if it was non-trivial fact, I'll be very happy, but these two are classical results in that theory, so I was not so happy, but um, the statement goes like this. So if you apply a connected sum of not, you see what I mean? So you delete some part of the not and connect it by two arcs, then the Jones polynomial is a product of original knots. And the second one is there's a there's an operation called mut mutation. So you pick this circled area and you can flip it like this or flip upside down or flip upside down and left and right. And I can show that I could show that uh, Jones polynomial of mutants are the same. So this is my application. And as I said, this is classical results and well known, but uh, I think there's a way to understand not theory, the uh, a theory of ribbon graph or theory of uh, graph theory. So I hope this can be go further. So, and that's all I got for today. And thank you for listening. The ribbon graph from the knot diagram. Okay. Uh, are there ever any half twists? Uh, 
No, no, no. Uh, um, you can define. I mean, there is a way. I mean, there is uh, lots of way to obtain transform linear using similar arguments like this. Right. But uh, in in this particular theorem, I just put not diagram like this. Yeah. So this is a planar uh, diagram. So when you apply all a smoothing. What you get is something like this. So, what you get is disjoint union of circle drawn in the plane. There are no intersections. So, when when you remember where were the uh, crossings, where the crossings were, you can put something like this. So, this is what all A smoothings are. So, uh, there is information about the points. Oh, uh, no, 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 because. Ah, okay, okay. I, I see what you mean. Yeah. Because, you know, um, suppose we have this one, and you may um, are worried about something like this. Yeah, I just changed this crossing here. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if I do all a smoothing here, I'll just draw it because I drew it too much time. I get this one. And if I do all a smoothing here, all these are same, so I draw the same one. But in here, I if I do a left turn when I go through the over arc, this one looks like this. And the edge, yeah. And this one. I mean, the change, the crossing, is actually uh, taking a partial draw. I, so that, that's edge, okay, we have that edge like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I see, I see. So this one and this one is related to a partial draw. So, so right. yeah. Um, uh, but that's what I want to get in, in this <laughs> when I came to IVS. But um, yeah, actually, Professor Um uh, suggested one so <laughs> today, and that was uh, <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Uh, there is a lots of set system defined. I mean, that is similar to uh, delta metroid. I mean, um, and there are lots of uh, graph-like objects. Uh, Professor Om um suggested something like something like this. This. From this, we can obtain a so-called isotropic system. And I can think of other things, like, you know, I mentioned that ribbon graph is a graph on surface, but I kind of lie. Because I have to say this embedding is cellularly embedded. Uh, uh, what I mean by that is, the uh, if I uh, subtract graph, all I have left is a uh, distant union of disk. That's what cellularly embedded means. So this one is cellularly embedded, but if I draw graph like this, because if I, if I subtract this, what I obtain is a analyst. So this is not cellularly embedded. But you, you actually can do similar theory in this kind of graph on surface. You can think of some set system defined on this kind of graphs on surface. And you can ask if there is a characterization to obtain uh, uh, isomorphic set system from different graphs on surface. Or, or you can ask uh, which Eulerian cycle, I guess, to obtain the uh, same isotropic system. Uh, all these kind of question 
uh, analogous to a fitness to isomorphism theorem. That is what I can say. And to be honest, I was thinking of a question. I mean, I mentioned that if G and H have same isom I mean isomorphic delta matroids, they have same robust real dumb polynomial. But this is far from characterization of which graphs have same robust rhythm polynomial. So, or maybe, uh, maybe I should ask if I have uh, two graphs with isomorphic cyclometroids, their top polynomial are the same. But there's long standing question of uh, when we have a Isomor I mean, same top polynomial. So this question is known to be difficult, but um, maybe there is a character characterization of, I mean, not the full characterization, but somehow characterizes. I was interested in this question because there is a long-standing question of Jones uh, says that uh, you know Jones polynomial of on not is one. And Jones asked if uh, this is the unique knot having the trivial Jones polynomial. So that's what Jones asked. And this is, uh, I believe this is still open question. So, yeah. But, but all, to be honest, these questions are f far from my research because yeah, this question is far more difficult to answer. Thank you, thank you.